your velocity profile looks like this. This is the Poisson. Poisson. Now it's, I guess it's another S, E, U, I, L, M, something like this. Poisson flow, we have, we can solve this exactly. We can solve the, 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 the full Navier Stokes equations exactly because the problem is pretty simple. We can also solve when we have two rotating cylinders, omega 1, omega 2, and we have fluid inside between the two, we can also solve this problem exactly, right? Uh, not only steady ones, we have unsteady ones like the Stokes problem. If we have this wall oscillating back and forth with u cosine omega t, we can know how the flow above this wall oscillates in time and along y, right? We can solve these problems exactly. Of course, this is not the topic of this course. Probably you have seen it before in other courses. On the other hand, we can do approximate solutions. of more complicated problems. Okay. And here we have uh, two limits of Navier Stokes equations. As you can tell from this equation, the high Reynolds number limit, if Reynolds number goes to infinity, so you can see immediately that the viscous term vanishes and you have this equation. This is the Euler's equation. So no viscosity, it's inviscid or infinite Reynolds number. But the issue is it's still nonlinear. You have du by dt is equal to negative double up here. Remember this term has the local and convective, it has u dot nabla u in it. So this is nonlinear, it didn't solve much. Okay? But anyway, in our applications for airplanes, typically the Reynolds number in the order of 10 millions. So this term might be very small, and it's, if it's very small, it doesn't affect your computations, it's, it's better to neglect it. Okay? It might not help much. But because you have still have the nonlinear. However, there exists a unique solution to the Euler's equation. So this problem has been solved. Okay? We cannot, we don't have an analytical solution, that's fine, but from a mathematical point of view, mathematicians always like existence questions. Why? Because it's not wise to waste your entire life solving a problem whose solution does not even exist. Right, so it's better to have a proof that the solution exists a priori. So uh, mathematicians proved an existence here, and uh, it is very surprising if you look uh, Marsden, the father of mechanics, Jerry Marsden. He made a similarity between this set of equations. Remember, this is a PDE, so it's an infinite dimensional already. The number of degrees of freedom are infinite because every particle in the fluid has three degrees of freedom, and we have infinite of those. So it's an infinite dimensional system, it's a PDE. He showed that this equation is exactly the same as the equations of a rigid body having three degrees of freedom. By very, very high level and abstract math that you can spend it out maybe three, four years just to understand the paper. So uh, of course we'll not talk about it here, but you can go and waste your time and learn maybe 10 courses in that so that you'll be able to understand it, but it's beautiful. Anyway, on the other hand, we have the Reynolds number goes to zero limit. This is called the Stokes flow. Highly viscous fluid in the Stokes flow Actually, we use a, a different scaling argument to arrive at the Stokes limit. In this scaling argument, we scale the P by mu u over L, not draw u infinite squared, because the dynamic pressure is not dominant anymore. And you arrive at the Stokes equation, which is in which the pressure forces, they balance the viscous forces. And it's linear. That's great, okay? It's linear. There is no nonlinear term here. 
Any question about this taxonomy? This course is more of a discussion. It's, a, it's, a, it's an advanced graduate course in the sense it's not required for a prelim. It doesn't have to be structured. It can really evolve as we speak. So if you have any question, please come up with it. Okay? Yes, Lee. Uh, what did you say about the airplanes having higher numbers? Number? Very high numbers number. So this term is very, very small, so you can really neglect it. Okay. In, in most of the applications, sometimes it gets Sometimes, even it's small, it, it provides a significant contribution. But most of the cases, if you solve oil, you solve oil and some of your strokes on an, on an airplane wing, and you, most of the time you get very, very similar solution, particularly for the global quantities like the left and drag. Any question? OK, so uh, if you are here, OK, so it depends on your application. If you are in a microfluidic guy, you will go here to Stokes flow. If you are an aerospace engineer like ours, we will stick to here, and this did not help much because the nonlinear term is still there. So we need more clever assumptions than just assume minus number equal infinity. This does not help by its, its own. Okay? And to understand the coming assumption, which is a brilliant assumption, we'll discuss it next time, we need some tools. So uh, like the necessary tools that we learned last time, we learned about circulation and how it affects lift. Now we're going to learn about vorticity. What's vorticity? It's the local version of circulation. So it's a local, a local measure of flow rotationality. It's defined as the curl of the velocity field. So just nabla cross, okay? Nabla cross you. Okay. So uh, how to describe it? It's indeed we're looking locally, not you cannot just look globally and see, oh, the fluid rotates, so it has vorticity. No, at all are we gonna see that. It's locally. We have to look at the particle itself. Does it rotate it about itself, about its axis, as it moves or not? Okay? So the fluid particle can go in a curved flow, like this. But it's always, the path was curved, but it's always points in this direction. So it doesn't rotate about itself while moving. This means there is no vorticity. Okay? The fluid particle can move in a straight path while rotating, right? This means, although that the path was straight, but there is vorticity. And we're going we're gonna to see this in detail, because it's, it's very essential to understand vorticity. So, if the fluid particle, if the fluid particle is frozen to be a solid sphere, the omega, the angular velocity, because we can, we can deal with, as mechanics, mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers, we can understand very well the angular velocity of a rigid body, the angular velocity of a sphere. We can measure it, radians per second, we can understand it very much. So the omega, the angular velocity of the sphere, is half of your vorticity, okay? So you can see they are, they are the same. So your vorticity is the angular velocity of the thing, but quantitatively, one is twice the other. So, let's take an example. I'm just reminding you here that nabla can be it's partial partial xi, partial partial yj, partial partial zk. This is in this trad i, j, and k. But it also partial partial r, er in the cylindrical coordinates, 1 over r partial partial theta, e theta, and 
partial partial Z in the EZ. Here is here is if you have these axes I and J and you're rotating by some theta, so this is ER, the particular is E theta in the plane and you have vertically upward EZ and of course if you took 241 you're very well aware of this okay uh, just one thing caveat here because people usually tend to forget it is that these vectors do not change right so uh, partial partial anything of I this I does not change so partial partial anything for I is zero and the same for J and K, these are inertial frame. The, 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 the same here for Z, EZ, partial partial anything for EZ is zero because it's fixed. But because ER and E theta rotates, so uh, if you differentiate them, they might, they, you might get non-zero terms. So partial, in, in particular, partial partial theta, ER is E theta, and partial partial theta of E theta is negative E. If you don't know how to prove this, I'll assign them as a quiz. But not quiz, as a homework. No, you, you, can, you can come to my office and I'll prove it just in a minute. So, let's take an example, or actually three examples, because this is very important. Three examples with some physical meaning. So example one is a rigid body. So example one. Rigid body rotation. So uh, we have a tank like here, and this tank we have a motor, and we rotate the tank by an angle of velocity omega. We rotate the tank, and we leave it for a while. So at the beginning, the tank will force the fluid inside to rotate. If we wait long enough after a steady state the fluid inside will move exactly with the tank, with the same angular velocity. So each particle has the same angular velocity omega as the, as the tank, okay? So if we compute the vorticity here, if we compute the vorticity omega, how much we expect? How much omega, how much this uh, vorticity you expect? Twice this omega, right? So let, let's get that. So uh, in order to get little omega, we need the uh, velocity field. So the velocity field is is radial component, tangential component in general, and vertical component. You can see here clearly that we don't have these two guys, and we only have a tangential component. That is, how much is the tangential component of a rigid body rotation? How much is the tangential component? You have a particle that is here at a distance r from the origin omega r omega r right very good okay so we got this let's get the let's get little omega now which is not lacrosse so it's partial partial r e r 1 over r partial partial theta e theta plus partial partial z e z to this acting cross product on Omega R E theta, okay? And among the things that I'm reminding you, I mean, I don't need to, but that's okay. I, J, K, this is the order of rotation, right? So, um, if, you are with the, if you do I cross J, get K, and vice versa, if you go against the direction, you get negative, and the same here, E R E theta E C, okay? So let's do that. So this is the first term here, partial partial r, e r acting with this guy. So uh, partial partial r acting here. So these are two terms, by the way, okay? Magnitude and direction. Partial partial r acting on the magnitude, which is omega r, you get simply omega. Then you have e r cross e theta. There is another term, okay? There is another term. What's the other term? is that partial partial r is acting on e theta, not omega r, because these are two terms multiplied and you're differentiating, so 
e theta times the derivative of that, we're done here, plus omega r times the derivative of e theta. The derivative of e theta is e r, or negative of it, and e r cross itself is zero, okay? I'll do another one so that it becomes clear, so let's move on. This term cross that term, so again, partial partial theta of the magnitude, this is zero, Partial partial theta for the direction. Okay, so we have omega r as an outside divided by r. Here it is. Omega r divided by r. And we have e theta from here. Here is e theta. Cross. Cross what? Partial partial theta acting on e theta. So this, this computation has to be done carefully, okay? Or you use this standard form. You can use it, by the way. Okay? So partial partial theta, e theta, this is uh, negative e r, as we said, and e theta cross negative e r, this is e z. And we have these two r's go away. Then we don't have any more terms because the, there's nothing with z at all. So we have here e r cross e theta is e z. We have omega in the z direction and another omega in the z direction. And we expected that from the beginning to get 2 omega as a magnitude, and of course, it's about the z direction, okay? So, in two dimensions, yes, so in, this, in this example, um, the particle is rotating, it's actually rotating about an axis which is in the middle of the container, right? Instead of the axis of the particle. I'll itself. show you a video for that in a minute. Two dimensions. In two dimensions, you can compute the vorticity in, a, in an interesting way. If you have a point here, you attach two axes, two, two, any two perpendicular axes to the point. Attach this guy, AA, and attach another perpendicular axis, BB, OK? And you get compute there the velocity, the angular velocity of each axis. So the angular velocity omega b here, the angular velocity omega b, and the angular velocity omega a here. And your vorticity is simply omega a plus omega b. So for a rigid body, for a rigid body, all the axes, all the axes rotate by the same amount. So this guy has an angular velocity omega, this guy has the same angular velocity omega, if you add them you get two omega. But this is just for a rigid body, if you have something different, these two guys will rotate differently and we're going to see this in a minute. Any question about that? Yes? Uh, 